Hello and happy Indigenous Peoples Day in the Office of Human Rights and Equity. We are so excited uh, to take this opportunity to celebrate the stories, the contributions, and the history of Indigenous and Native people. Uh, we are particularly excited to do this here in Howard County because while Indigenous Peoples Day is not a federal holiday, it is recognized locally and throughout a variety of states. And we're just so excited that our uh, county executive, Dr. Calvin Ball, believes that Indigenous Peoples Day is one that deserves spotlight, one that deserves uh, notoriety and one that should be celebrated. And so today we have an amazing guest that is going to share with us not only the history of Indigenous Peoples Day and just Indigenous and Native people, but particularly share his poetry and his writings and his work as well. And so we are looking forward to just celebrating the culture, the voices, the names, um, and the stories of Native peoples this afternoon. And so with that said, I'd like to introduce you to our guest, Mr. Edgar Gabriel Silex. He is the author of two poetry collections from Northwestern University Press, formerly known as Curbstone Press. And those uh, uh, works are entitled Through All the Displacements, nominated for the National Book Award, and Acts of Love, a finalist for the National Poetry Series. He has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Maryland State Arts Council. His most recent published work appears in Gargoyle, Scribble, Free State Review, Lock Raven Review, Baltimore Review, The Sunken Garden Poetry Anthology, and In On Barcelona. It is at this time that I am so excited to introduce to some and present to others Mr. Edgar Silex. Edgar, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we can't wait for you to share with us. Biali Tonali, Claudia Allen, Tlasico Mati, Ninoza, Zaniloa, Ika, Mase Walil, Wit. Uh, gracias uh, por invitarme. Buenos días, uh, Claudia Ellen, y gracias por invitarme a uh, hablar uh, del Día de los Indígenas. Uh, thank you, uh, Claudia Allen, and thank you for inviting me to speak uh, about uh, and on uh, uh, the subject of uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, my name is Edgar Silex, and I, um, I identify as Indigenous. Um, and uh, the tribes from which I arise from, uh, come from, are um, uh, the Tequeche and um, uh, Yaqui. Um, now, I identify myself as indigenous as opposed to Native American. I think there needs to be a distinction made here um, uh, concerning why I identify as indigenous. Uh, it's important uh, to understand, if you will, uh, the, the major differences uh, between these uh, two uh, ways of, of identifying uh, oneself. Um, and when you are identify as Native American, you are identifying uh, specifically to uh, people in the 40, lower 48 states. Uh, of the United States. And uh, these names, uh, whether it's American Indian or Native American, are tied to the way in which um, uh, the first contact and the consequences of that uh, played out in the history of Indigenous America. Um, there are several names that are used in the United States. Uh, there are um, Native Hawaiians, there are Native Alaskans, there are Pacific Islanders, and there are Native Americans or American Indians, and there are also indigenous people. Um, now, South, or let's say in Canada, people are known as First Nations. Uh, so these are distinctions that have to do with the, I, with the first contact with the Europeans um, uh, and the consequences of that uh, uh, 
meeting between indigenous people and European peoples. Now, south of the border, almost from Mexico all the way uh, south uh, to um, Tierra del Fuego, um, people are indigenous people are simply uh, called indigenous. They're not called by their tribal identities. Um, they are all uh, tied together as as simply as indigenous. And there's a reason for that. And part of the reason is the way in which um, uh, indigenous people have agency within each government. So within the United States, um, Native Americans have uh, treaties, uh, land trusts, uh, responsibilities between the indigenous the Native American nations that were um, in conflict or whatever uh, uh, with Europeans. And um, so this whole group of people have a different set of history. Uh, and that's why they refer to themselves as Native Americans, as um, American Indians. Um, and also the differences have to deal with um, what that contact meant at first, you know, when, when, when uh, Europeans first arrived here. Uh, that sort of defines these terms. Uh, south of the border of uh, indigenous people are, uh, do not have these kind of relationships. They don't have uh, blood quantum relationships. They don't have, uh, 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 um, tribal uh, treaties that they made with uh, Mexican governments or Guatemalan governments south of the border, all the way down south. These these uh, contacts were different, and they occurred much earlier, uh, uh, about 150 years earlier than the contacts that occurred in uh, uh, North America. So uh, south of the border. Um, you know, and I want to take you back essentially because this is about Columbus Day. It's about uh, being um, replaced or uh, um, changed so that it becomes uh, Indigenous Peoples Day in order to celebrate Indigenous people uh, and not uh, someone who has a history of, of, of brutality. Uh, who brought with him uh, a, a very, very uh, brutal history in the treatment of Native Americans, uh, indigenous people uh, from all over. And it's important to understand these differences um, because, you know, if I said that I'm Native American, for example, uh, uh, I'm actually en en encroaching uh, uh, on uh, very important uh, matters to uh, uh, Native Americans, and that is um, this thing, the, the Native Americans have uh, responsibilities uh, between them, their, their nations and uh, the U.S. government and these uh, that are bound in treaties. Um, and so uh, for them, it's a matter of survival. It's a matter of uh, you know, anyone can't just call themselves Native American because then you are, in a sense, taking from them uh, those things, those promises which were made uh, between uh, uh, Native American nations and uh, the the United States government. Um, that's why. That's one reason. For example, I've never uh, applied for anything or get, allow myself to get published in uh, anything that says uh, Native American. If it's for Native Americans, I don't even uh, attempt to uh, submit my work to those journals. I don't apply for grants under those names, those terms, because I am indigenous. And what that means to me is that uh, most of my ancestors come from south of the U.S. border. Um, my ancestors come from the state of Jalisco and the state of Chihuahua. Um, the Tequeche were from Jalisco, and I can trace my ancestry all the way back to the mid uh, uh, 
uh, 1800s, uh, the 19th century, uh, when I can, where I have found uh, marriage certificates um, where it says uh, specifically um, India or Indian uh, without any reference to their indigenous tribes or whatever, the marriage certificate simply states that they are Indian. Uh, this was the way in which uh, the Spaniards, which are, you know, uh, a different entity uh, that participated in, uh, in, in, in the, um, uh, what, what I, what is called the globalization, the first moment of globalization, really. Um, so they handled indigenous people differently than the way the English and the French handled uh, Native American nations. Uh, the, 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 the differences are very, very different, very stark. Uh, uh, the Spaniards came here with the intent, in fact, Columbus himself wrote uh, in his uh, um, request for funds uh, to the king of Spain, he wrote uh, specifically that he intended to come uh, to these lands, or whatever lands he found, and to literally to enslave and to um, and to uh, take territory from whoever lived there. Um, these, this, this. This this is very different from the people who came uh, to Roanoke and to uh, Plymouth Rock. Uh, they came as corporations, chartered corporations, um, where they arrived here literally as as employees or uh, as people who had were intended to uh, provide profits to the ones who had fund, funded their voyage here. So we have two different way, uh, two different intents, if you will, of the um, um, pilgrimage of, of Europeans uh, to the United States. There are two very distinct intents, and therein lies the word where the word arises, indigenous, uh, because for the Spaniards. Um, the attempt was to erase completely um, uh, native history and native culture. Uh, not that the, uh, 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 the same thing wasn't attempted in uh, the United States, but it was a different approach uh, completely. Um, when the Spaniards arrived here, um, uh, I you know, they, they had the intent of enslaving uh, indigenous people um, and taking their land and their property. Um, and so uh, when they arrived here, uh, they uh, came here um, uh, and acted very brutally. Uh, not that, again, that this does not happen in other places, but uh, it, it's important to note that, that um, indigenous was the sort of generalized term that was used for all native peoples that the Spaniards and the Portuguese uh, came in contact with. Um, they were never identified by their tribal nations and things of that nature. They were always called Indians. Whereas if you look at the history of native North America, um, the wars were often between tribes and the U.S. government. They were often between you know, um, people of the Sun Fires, the uh, Lahota, Nakota, um, the Hota people uh, against the Apaches, against the Comanches. So these were nations that um, that were in conflict with the uh, Europeans. Uh, and so uh, this identity sort of was retained uh, um, in uh, the U.S., uh, whereas it's south of the border, uh, most of the people, uh, especially in Mexico, uh, where my indigenous history comes from, uh, there was an effort to completely wipe these, this uh, tribal uh, identity from uh, entirely uh, from from the, uh, New Spain, if you will. Um, so that's that's the difference between indigenous people and uh, Native Americans. Um, 
Now, uh, if you look at the census this year, for example, uh, 2020 census that just came out, um, Native Americans uh, have doubled in the last 10 years. There are now uh, about 8 million uh, uh, Native Americans, uh, people who identify as Native Americans. That's, uh, you know, it's twice what it was in 2010. Um, and part of that is that more and more people are identifying uh, as Native Americans. Um, and also, uh, there are people in the US who are like me, who are indigenous, um, who in the census, uh, there isn't a, 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 you know, a, a line to check that says indigenous. It says more things like, uh, Pacific Islander, uh, Native Hawaiian, uh, you know, uh, uh, Native Alaskan or Native American. There's no indigenous, but there are many indigenous people here in the U.S., uh, many who have migrated here from the South, uh, from all the way from Honduras, Guatemala, uh, Salvador, uh, Mexico. They live here in the U.S., and they identify as native, I mean, as indigenous people. Um, the other thing, um, uh, you know, in, in Mexico, um, there were at the point of contact, there were 25 million people living in the central part of Mexico uh, when um, uh, uh, Cortes first arrived in the Yucatan. Um, it was, um, you know, uh, and, and in Mexico today, the way you identify as indigenous is not by your tribal affiliation, but by your ability to speak a native language. So indigenous in Mexico is anyone who speaks uh, in part or in whole their native language, who has retained a native language. And there are about 21, a little over 21 million people in Mexico who still speak uh, one of the uh, 91 uh, different dialects or, or tribal dialects of, of their 91 tribes in Mexico, um, but they speak their own dialects of uh, their languages. Uh, but there are also 25 million people, one uh, almost a, a fourth of, of Mexicans identify as indigenous because many of them will only speak uh, their native languages in part. Uh, and so in the census in Mexico, uh, about 25 million native uh, uh, indigenous people live there, uh, 21 million of whom still speak their indigenous language. And that's how Mexico identifies indigenous people. And that's where I come from. I am indigenous uh, and I am connected uh, to my tribes through this indigeneity, through this connection. Um, uh, I'm trying to relearn my language. Um, I'm trying to make connections um, to my history, to the history of the Tequeche and the Yaqui, um, and, uh, and trying to reconnect, if you will, uh, to that uh, identity. Uh, in North America, uh, often people like me are called lost birds. There, there are people who got assimilated and lost, if you will, from their tribal roots, uh, but they, they're coming back in large numbers uh, and re-identifying and reconnecting to their, to their tribal histories and their tribal languages. Uh, I'm doing the same thing, and there are re literally uh, hundreds of thousands of Mexicans and Chicano people, Mexican-Americans, who are doing the same thing. And in the US, they are identifying not as Chicano uh, only, but as uh, indigenous, as Native Americans. Um, so that's the history of these, this, this uh, different terms. Um, the other thing I think that's important uh, to talk about uh, is that, you know, this we're talking about Columbus Day as well as Indigenous Peoples Day because. Um, there is an effort to try to uh, make in the US and across the entire hemisphere uh, to make a day uh, to celebrate uh, indigenous contributions to the world, 
uh, to not to uh, taint uh, this the moment of contact um, with the history of somebody who was a brutal uh, dictator, if you will. Uh, not to connect that date to that, but to a more positive tone, which is uh, the celebration of indigenous people and their contributions. Um, and uh, and so, uh, you know, it's important to understand uh, some of the history, some of the things that happened. Um, uh, and I'll take you very quickly sequentially through some of these things. Um, in it's and it's very very important to understand that 1492 was an incredible year in the world. Um, 1492 was not just the year uh, October 12th when Columbus landed in what is now known as Hispaniola, uh, the Dominican Republic and Haiti. It, he uh, that's the first place he landed. Uh, it's not just that first contact. It is also the first day of globalization it is the first day in which a group of people came across in an effort to uh, exploit and extract. Uh, it's the first moment when that happens in the world. It's also the moment, a year in which uh, Spain, uh, after 700 years of Moorish rule, finally defeats the Moors and uh, attempts to unify Spain uh, uh, through what uh, uh, they saw as the only thing that unified them, which was Christianity. Uh, so in 1492, not only did uh, Columbus come here, uh, the Spaniards consolidated uh, Spain and they kicked out uh, all the people who would not, they forced, uh, if you will, uh, Jews and Muslims to convert. They were called conversos. They were supposed to convert to Christianity. Uh, and anyone who did not convert was either killed or, or uh, forced to leave uh, Spain. Uh, so this, this history in Spain is all exported um, to, the, to the Americas, to uh, the Caribbean, and uh, to uh, Mexico and to South America, um, the thing that they that that the Spaniards attempted to do in order to erase indigenous history was to unify uh, the indigenous people um, and their their tribal nations through uh, Christianity. So that was the main way in which they could erase. Uh, the, the historical and the cultural uh, identities of people, uh, uh, indigenous people, uh, through this sort of Christian uh, um, ideology. Uh, and so they brought that. Uh, this also happened in North America, not to be outdone, you know, the, um, the Native North American people, uh, indigenous people, Native Americans, um, you know, all the tribal schools, for example, uh, that were created, the boarding schools, uh, they were all run by um, different denominations of Christians, uh, uh, you know, Methodists, uh, 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 you know, Calvinists, uh, uh, Catholics, you know, every school was run and th th these schools were, were attempting to uh, what was called um, you know, kill the Indian and save save the person. Um, the same thing that that the Spaniards were attempting with uh, trying to convert indigenous people and unite them uh, through uh, the idea of Christianity. Um, so they exported this idea of solidifying Spain through Christianity to the U.S. and to uh, the Americas uh, in an effort to unify these tribes and to erase their history. Um, so, you know, those things are uh, the history uh, in, uh, of, of, of Columbus and there's a lot of negativity that's associated with it. Um, whereas with Indigenous Peoples Day, there is a very positive uh, contribution Native Americans have made to the world. Um, uh, 
Uh, I'll start. Actually, I'm going to read a poem. Um, I, I, I want to say the one thing. There are differences, so many differences uh, between indigenous peoples in the in the uh, in the two turtle islands or in Semanewak, you know, the whole Western hemisphere. There are incredible differences. Uh, in fact, uh, if you take, for example, uh, just the languages, there are in North America, there are eight root languages languages which are as distinct as uh, English is to Chinese, okay? There, there's no way to communicate between the two. There are eight root languages just in North America. Um, in Europe, in the entire Eurasia, there are only four. So there are twice as many root languages. These are differences just in language. Uh, genetically, uh, if you take people from the uh, genetics uh, uh, of people, say, from the Southwest, I mean, from uh, the Pueblo people, the Seti people from uh, the uh, uh, Mexican Gulf, and you compare the, that their genetics to the genetics of, say, the people uh, from the Yucatan who speak Kech, uh, Kiche, uh, their genetic differences is as different, again, as it is as the genetics between the people from uh, England and the people from China. That's how different uh, they are. So there is no sort of monolithic uh, indigenous uh, uh, people. Uh, the thing that unifies us all, I, I would say, are primarily two very, very important things. One is spirituality. Uh, Indigenous people are, are very spiritual. Uh, and the other thing that uh, unites us is our reverence for our Mother Earth and uh, our relationship uh, to Mother Earth uh, and how uh, we relate to it in terms of, uh, of seeing it not as something uh, which we uh, subjugate, but something which we are uh, um, part of something which we are um, connected to, um, something which we participate in and are not really uh, there to subjugate or whatever. We are, in, in a sense, uh, very united across the entire uh, uh, Hemisphere in that sense that you know we're very spiritual, and we are very connected to uh, um, the earth as our mother, as 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 caretakers. Um, uh, in fact, um, before I read this, I, I should say, uh, indigenous identity, Native American identity, often related to how the people relate to the earth. In other words. Many indigenous people believe that the land that they lived on, their ancestral lands, was ceded to them by their creator and ceded to them to take care of, to honor, to respect, to, uh, to live within its means uh, and to share it. Uh, so this, is, this, this was, uh, was very, um, this is the reason why there was such turmoil when the land was taken from them, uh, when land was appropriated, uh, when land was, uh, when they were moved onto reservations or corralled into, uh, you know, unwanted uh, uh, land, which was not productive or infertile land or whatever. Uh, so their connection to this, to their spirituality, uh, to their, uh, to their tr uh, tribal history, all those things um, uh, were was devastating to many indigenous tribes, and um, and so uh, they were deeply affected uh, by this um, breaking between uh, 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 their connections to the earth. Um, so I read this this poem, um, which is called "Medicine Bundles." Um, 
and it sort of shows you a little bit about this connection, the connection that I make. Medicine bundles, winter. All around me at 3 a.m., it looks like dusk or dawn. The full moon turning eight inches of new snow on the ground into a glow lamp. The snow drifts look lit from beneath the earth. Moonlight penetrates so deeply, the shadows are stark and clear. It's freezing, but I'm outside watching a fox and some deer make their rounds through the neighborhood, taking in the silence. Then I hear the snow plows, the salt trucks beeping, the deer bolt trying to get back to the safety of the woods. Through my backyard, I go inside so they won't fear my presence. The fox leaves his prints in the front yard, having no problem cutting through the fence or showing me the den he escaped to. Spring, in the morning, a deer came to visit. He brought his big-eyed innocence as he munched a wild rose leaf at the edge of the woods behind my house, brought my child a job interview at a nice law firm, brought a large sum of money needed to solve a medical issue, brought the wisdom of how to survive a deep downturn, and brought a sharp consciousness of my connection to the mystery abounding all around me. Summer, a neighbor's fruiting mulberry teems like a coral reef. Even the shy groundhog hog feasts in broad daylight beneath orioles, cardinals, peckers, robins, squirrels, blue jays, red wings, starlings, and wandering crows. A squirrel hanging upside down loosens a few ripe mulberries for the groundhog. Watching them through my window, I swim in bliss for hours. Fall, a powerful red-tailed hawk perches on a dogwood in my backyard, chomping down a small critter, wipes his beak on the bark branches, spreads his wings, cooling himself, for a few minutes before diving into the shadows of the forest, leaving in his solitariness, leaving his solitariness echoing in me. Um, I also, you know, I'm trying to find my roots back. Uh, I'm trying to uh, relearn my uh, indigenous language, Nahuatl. Uh, uh, tribes from which I come from, the Tequeche, uh, no longer exist as a tribal entity. Um, in the mid 1800s, uh, the Tequeche, who were one of the very last uh, tribes to be uh, uh, converted, if you will, for lack of a better term, converted to Christianity in the sense that they were all baptized uh, and given new names at the point of baptismals, what the Spaniards did is they uh, they gave people a, a Spanish name so that they would not uh, remember their or whatever, uh, be connected to their indigenous name and to their tribal connections. This was a way of erasing this. So the Tequeche, though they are no longer exist, we're still here. Uh, we're still uh, uh, trying to reconnect, trying to come back and um, and um, create both a cultural identity, a tribal identity, uh, uh, and uh, an, a, an entity that can um, have agency and speak uh, and self and have self determination. A very important part of being indigenous is the uh, idea of self determination. So uh, even though the Tequeche no longer exists, there are still a lot of um, rituals, a lot of uh, stories, a lot of uh, processes that still happen in Jalisco uh, and in specifically 
in um, the, the, the town um, from where my answers come from. Uh, for example, um, uh, in researching my own history, I find these interesting connections. Uh, my great, great grandmother uh, was married um, in the town um, of uh, Kukyo. She was from the town of Yawalika. Uh, and Yawalika is uh, about uh, 20 miles or so northeast of uh, Kukyo. Now, she married a man from Kukyo. Uh, and in the uh, uh, marriage records, where it says that my grandmother was India, an Indian, uh, and um, um, it, I also found that her daughter, my great grandmother, also married, who was from Yawalika, also married a man from Kukyo. Now, my grandmother, uh, who emigrated here to the U.S. and lived in El Paso, she also married a man from Kukyo, who had also emigrated to El Paso. So there is this history, this tradition of the Tequeche marrying people from uh, adjoining towns. So we know that that's their, you know, uh, scholarship is trying to reconnect all these stories. Um, even though uh, they don't no longer exist, we know a lot about, uh, for example, how they survived. Um, the main food source, for example, of the Tequeche was uh, amaranth and chia seed, okay? Uh, this was their main staple uh, in, in addition to corn. Uh, these were the things that they lived on. Uh, so part of my own uh, attempts to reconnect is through the foods, through learning what it is that is cooked in Yawalika, Yawalika and uh, Kukyo, to learn the dishes that come from there because uh, that history is embedded in those uh, traditions, in, those, uh, in, in the way the food uh, was revered, the way it was grown, all those sorts of things. Uh, so part of my uh, uh, reconnection is attempting to do this. I do this by, um, I eat chia very often on my yogurts. I put it in my soups. I eat amaranth in my soups. I make uh, all sorts of dishes with these foods, uh, which I'm learning how um, to cook and how to utilize as a main source of food. So that reconnects me uh, to that. It also, um, you know, uh, it's important for me uh, uh, to learn these things. I also um, wanted to read another poem. Um, uh, this is about learning um, my own language. Um, suffice to say that uh, in my family, no one has spoken Nahuatl in over um, 175 years. Uh, as far as I know, no one uh, spoke it. So um, for me to reconnect this, uh, to connect this, um, I wrote this poem and it's called, uh, We Love You. And it's, uh, it's actually, a short poem in the form of a, of a tanka poem, a Japanese form. Every noun verb reconquered resists the 200 years since my ancestors last said aloud, Dimits Trasotla, we love you. Um, in addition to that, I, I, I read this other poem, um, which is called Maps. Had no maps or topography to follow, marking the past existences, successes, or failures practiced by my ancestors, either from those that endured, nor from those that perished when history was burying whole cultures, temples, mythologies in its colonial mass graves. Had no parents who fed the past or kept it alive, 
who could talk, who could walk the trail back to the named world before grandfathers and grandmothers disappeared, the way languages vanished into the histories where truth left few tracks, a signpost perhaps, a commodified noun, town or festival, I've wandered through life a ghost, searching for a tongue through which I could speak to the wat with the water and the earth. I am a foreigner to the trees, to the creatures living in their medicine spirits and monks in their animal habits. I don't seek them out, but I go to let my soul listen to the rolling wind waves crash against the treetops. In winter, the bare branches are the silent voice of the emptiness into which I was born, where the spines of the cactus were my words, and the creosote scented rain was a trail of tears I followed to knowledge, to that archaeology with which I exhumed a few shards of a dialect without human pronunciations, its syntax of balance found in desert or forest, hidden like a jackrabbit among tumbleweed or a deer camouflaged in undergrowth, abiding for danger to pass, or for that bird of prey swooping us up in its wings, carrying us off into the heavens, into the awe of our last moment, where our roads and trails finally become clear, maps where we see each of us leaving a song wherever we wandered, leaving whispers, eroded histories, perhaps a colorful feather that falls from us like an answered prayer as the hawk carries us off and returns us. So uh, part of uh, celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day is uh, honoring our ancestors. Um, it's uh, it's uh, teaching, uh, having that moment to be able to teach uh, Indigenous history and Indigenous knowledge. Uh, it's also a day in which to celebrate Indigenous contributions to the world. And it's also a day to take pride in the survival of Indigenous people. And, uh, and by survival, I, it, it implies resistance, it implies conflict. Um, so part of uh, Indigenous Peoples Day is for Indigenous people to uh, celebrate that resistance, that 529 years now of resistance uh, that has allowed us to sustain ourselves, to sustain our tribal countries, our nations, our tribal uh, uh, histories, uh, our tribal stories, all those things. Uh, these are the things that sustained uh, many uh, indigenous nations through um, what in, in north of the border is often called first contact, but south of the border is often referred to as the conquista, the conquest, uh, because the, again, the methods of uh, or, or the goals uh, of the Europeans were different uh, uh, when they arrived here. So the conquest is really literally an effort to to completely conquer and 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 a people. Whereas uh, not that that's not what was happening in Native North America, uh, but um, uh, it was a different there were different means, different methods. Um, and so resistance was uh, essence, you know, of, of importance. Um, uh, indigenous peoples have been thrown everything at them, everything uh, in order to destroy them. Uh, everything from the first, very first um, uh, chemical warfare uh, used as diseases, of, you know, uh, infested blankets and uh, intentionally uh, spreading disease uh, in order to uh, um, eradicate and uh, exterminate uh, entire people. Um, everything from that all the way to even to the early 80s and late 70s, early 80s, when indigenous women were still being uh, sterilized. Uh, so everything has been thrown at them and yet we are still here. 
and Indigenous Peoples Day is that day in which we celebrate our resistance and our um, uh, our uh, continuation into the future. Um, so that's uh, you know that's one uh, the very important things um, to that, that we celebrate on that day. Um, and um, I'm sorry, you were going to say. Hi, so th you have said so much, Edgar, that I uh, really just wanted to thank you so much. I think one of the things before, I, I'd love for you to close with with more of your work, but I really wanted to kind of just dialogue with you for a minute about what you've shared so far. Um, I think one of the things that has stood out to me the most is uh, what you were talking about, just this this tie between uh, spirituality, Mother Earth, uh, the animals, and just all that nature brings to indigenous peoples. Um, in your first poem, uh, Medicine Bundles, you talked about um, the deer, it basically brought employment, it brought resources, it brought healing. Uh, explain that to us as we're listening how is it that that we can understand and connect to nature and see nature as bringing us these kinds of goods as well? Well, I mean, it's really uh, sort of. If you let me give you a very simple example, um, when it rains, people often you know uh, complain about it raining, right? It's oh, it's a rainy day. But what is rain? If you honor rain, do you know that what rain is doing is it's bringing food to your table. Mm -hmm. right? It's bringing the water that is needed for your plants to survive. So you honor that. So when you have a beautiful, for example, a female rain, especially after you've done planting, you have a soft female rain coming. You honor that. You're, you 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 cherish that, you connect to that because you know that it's a blessing given to you. It's, it's uh, you know, when I, 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 one of the things that my grandmother taught me was, you know, um, gardening, she was, a, she was an avid gardener. And so uh, next spring, for example, I'm gonna be planting amaranth and chia seeds in my garden, you know, just so that I can grow it like my ancestors did. Uh, and it connects me to that, uh, to my ancestors. It makes that I honor them by, I mean, again, uh, planting these things. And But the other thing that's important is that you have to believe. You have to believe that, uh, that there is healing uh, when you see nature. You know, uh, we go to nature to have peace, to find peace often, right? Well, that's healing. You're trying to heal, you're trying to reduce the stress in your life. This is healing. And sometimes uh, one of the things that I used to do is I would go out in my backyard and there will always be deer there. There were always deer coming around in my, in my, in my yard. Uh, and I would sing to them, I would hum. Uh, and they would sit there very quietly and listen to me like <laughs> I was insane or something. But you know, it 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 it's they made a connection with me, and I made a connection with them. Uh, they weren't as afraid of me. Uh, I wasn't as afraid of them. Another thing that I I would do, for example, is I had a very long battle with a groundhog when I moved into a house. Uh, this groundhog uh, had been living there. I'm sure that its ancestors had been there for hundreds of years, living along this creek. Uh, and, you know, lo and behold, they build a subdivision there and they build a house. And this, this, this family wanted to keep uh, living uh, in the area and living underneath my house. I had a shed at, that was connected to my house and it would come every winter and lay its babies under there and make its home. But uh, it would also, some of its babies would die in there and they would, they would have these infestations in my house, right? Mm. So I had to hit this long battle with it, trying to get it to uh, move on to say, okay, for the time being that I'm living here, you have to go somewhere else, right? Yeah. So finally I had to build this, uh, this concrete, if you will, uh, uh, flooring in which I could tie 
you know, a fencing around that he could not, that, that could not chew through. Uh, but at the same time, I also planted a garden uh, that had food uh, that the uh, groundhogs often, uh, you know, I had, a, I had a garden with vegetables in it and I took the fence down so that they could come and eat. Uh, the other thing I would do is I wouldn't mow my lawn so that they would come and the little, the little baby uh, groundhogs love to eat uh, mm -hmm. dandelion flowers. So I would leave all the dandelions and I would leave the fruit there and I did not, uh, you know, disturb them if they came and they, you know, chewed up my carrots or whatever it is they ate. So I shared my land with them. Um, I never put um, uh, things, uh, pesticides on my, on my, on my lawn, never mm -hmm. did that. Uh, and, you know, I had a family of frogs that lived in my front yard and they were there every year. So sometimes I would leave the front porch light on and they would jump on the porch and the light would attract all the bugs that they ate. So I left the light on for them to eat um, and things of that nature. So I shared my space uh, yeah. with all these animals and these things are good for you. You know, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel like you know, my neighbor's yard, they put in, you know, pesticides and there's nothing that grows there. You know, there's very few things that grow there. Whereas uh, I mean, they don't have, uh, uh, frogs are, are very, very volatile. You know, if you, if you put pesticides on the ground, they will die. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they didn't have frogs like I did. So here in this little plot of land and a little corner of my neighborhood, you know, there was a very pristine, if you will, well-kept, uh, ground where uh, animals could flourish. So, wow. you know, that's, that's how that's no, how that connection comes. No, that that is beautiful. I think one of the most beautiful, powerful things we can learn from Native and Indigenous peoples is uh, what it means to live with the earth. I think we have kind of taken the lesson from um, the colonialist project that the earth is something to be conquered. The earth is something that is to be stolen, to be taken, rather than something that is our is our living and breathing neighbor, a, a thing that, that, an entity that we must steward and care for and love and be in community with, live alongside. Um, I think that that's something that uh, we still need to learn and understand how to to walk in. The other poem that I loved all three of them. The other poem that I loved was Maps and the language that you used there when you were talking about things like colonial mass graves, when you were talking about uh, the fact that you were a foreigner to the trees, uh, just this this idea that the colonialist project had actually uh, made you a ghost to a very real culture and identity that that you are trying to find some kind of flesh connection to um, was was very powerful. Could you share with us a little bit more about that poem? Why did you write that poem? What what were you thinking about in in that creative process? Well, I'm. You know, I'm going through this, I'm learning Nahuatl and I'm learning how to you know, live as an indigenous person. Uh, I'm not tribally raised uh, like many uh, tribal people are, which uh, I honor and I respect greatly. And um, I mean, to me, they're, they're the lesson, they're, they're the way in which I go back. In fact, in fact, the things that I've learned, I've learned from other tribal people who have uh, their tribal roots still intact, who have managed to survive and resist. And uh, the things that I've learned on how, how to be indigenous comes from them. I know, I know that for people like me, uh, for even for a lot of uh, Chicanos and Mexican Americans and Mexicans and uh, also lost birds from all over indigenous, uh, from all over Samana Walk, uh, the way back uh, to our history is through these uh, tribal nations that have survived, that have retained, uh, um, you know, their form of government, their uh, their language, their uh, their arts, uh, their stories, all these things. This is the way back for all of us. So, um, you know, that's where I've learned that. And so, what I was trying to write was how that 
you know, how, uh, how uh, I'm trying to get there, you know, how there wasn't a way for me. Uh, my parents were completely assimilated. Uh, mm -hmm. Even though my grandparents, my grandfather, for example, often told me that he was Indian. You know, he said, I'm Indian, I'm indigenous. Uh, and so that's where I've learned that. That's where it comes from. That's why I have this connection to indigenousness because of my grandfather who uh, said that, who raised me. I, I grew up in my grandparents' home. So that connection was part of that, you know, trying to write that poem about what the way back is for me, uh, you know, how I'm trying to get there uh, through these uh, things, through, um, you know, uh, the plants that my grandmother taught me to, to plant, you know, she would plant sage and she would plant uh, yerba buena, uh, she would plant uh, uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, mints and things of that nature that were healing plants. Uh, plants that you use in order to either cleanse yourself or to heal yourself. And even though she had lost her Yaqui connection, you know, uh, she was from Chihuahua, uh, even though she had lost her Yaqui connection, she still had this connection to the, the plants that uh, were part of her indigenous history. And uh, she, you know, you got sick, the first thing she did was she gave you some chamomile, yerba buena, you know, some, you know, something, you know, it was all, there was always some basic thing, you know, even uh, the rubs that when I would get sick with pneumonia, she would create these rubs that she would put on my chest, you know, for me to be able to breathe. Um, they came from these mints and these menthol uh, plants that she would grow. Um, so, you know, uh, it, it, she taught me, even though they were disconnected from their tribal roots, um, they taught me that there are still pieces, there are still elements of our history uh, in the daily processes that we that we have. And, and part of the thing is to believe that the earth is a living thing, you know, that it is a it is a thing which is alive, which is grows, which uh, learns, which processes uh, just like human beings, um, and that we are part of that. You know, in fact, we are what we are because the earth is alive. Uh, it has consciousness, and it's faith in that. It's a belief in that, not in you know, some otherworldly heaven or hell or whatever you want to call it. Not in some, but that this thing here, this thing is alive. It's breathing. It's giving us sustenance. It's making us who we are. Wow. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Silas. I want to give you the opportunity to just close us out with more of your writings. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'll read a couple of poems very quickly. Um, Uh, let me do something for my book. Uh, this poem is called Everything Breathes. Consider the breath of a stone tectonically birthed from the depths of the earth. All day it inhales the sunlight, slowly expanding its igneous lung in awe of its life. Then gradually contracting, exhaling. It dies on its back to its mother. It lies with its back to its mother, gazing at the stars all night. When winter comes like a bear, it hibernates, sucks in less sun, sleeps in a cave of snow, dreaming it is a lizard, warming its crystalline quartz blood on a rock in the honey light of spring. Old river stones can dream, sometimes into, uh, can dream themselves into toads and turtles. Some desert stones are so clever, for years and years they dance on one toe, believing themselves ballerinas. Seeing them, sometimes I am forced to look twice, I bend down to make sure it's not a beetle, a mole, or a mouse. I pick up the stone and realize it's only the stone's soul I saw, dreaming itself into life. 
And uh, I will end with this poem. It's titled, uh, The Beautiful Thread. And we will remember we are filaments of sunlight. Remember to feel how we are threaded around vessels of wind, our skin, our eyes painted and glazed by sky and loam. And we will know the weaver, how we learned to crawl on her grass skin, how she weaves us as she weaves every strand of the dandelion seed. And we will remember she looms us equally from love as from pain. And we will memorize her scent, her rain, her vistas, not her replaceable names. Already when we have felt such great exhilaration that we saw our own wings, we remembered man was not meant to fly. So we have not forgotten everything is shaped in the wind patterns of wind, like the sinews of sands, the undulations of seaways. The wind changes everything that is its power. When lonely or confused, we made ourselves small, translucent, small quartz sand grains, dandelion seeds, and the wind carried us where we wanted to go. And we will always treat innocence as God's knife. So we do not cut ourselves with remorse. So we can know gentleness and compassion. And we will remember you, grandfather, saying, if we must close our eyes to dream, we will recognize our own deaths, our worries, our laughter, our free or guilty thoughts are all plumes of chant. We will remember everything in beauty. We will remember everything in beauty. That is the thread we are all woven from. Wow. Thank you so much, Edgar Silex. It is truly a pleasure to meet you, to converse with you, uh, and to share your voice and your work with this audience. We truly hope that you enjoyed this time. What's important for you to understand now is that indigenous people are people who are key contributors to our society, to our country, to our culture. And I thank Edgar Silex for sharing with us the beauty of their spirituality, the beauty of their language, the beauty of their culture, the beauty of how they challenge us to reconnect to Mother Earth, to nature to hear and understand how we are in community, not only with one another, but with the things that live and move and breathe around us. And so it is our hope that you take today to remember uh, to celebrate those who, as he said, have survived 529 years of an attempt at erasure, individuals who have uh, surmounted all kinds of horrific odds to remain key and critical parts of our human family. My name is Claudia Allen and I am an outreach coordinator here at the Howard County Office of Human Rights and Equity and it has truly been our pleasure to celebrate, uh, commemorate, and elevate the voices culture and language of indigenous people. We have so much going on throughout the month of October in celebration of Global Diversity Awareness Month. And so we want to make sure that you are following us on social media at HOCO, O-H-R-E, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. On there, you will be able to keep up with everything that we're doing throughout the month and as well as November, because we must remember that November is Native American History Month. And so while we thought through global indigenous peoples on today, we are going to focus specifically 
on the Native American experience in November. So we definitely want to make sure that you tune in and come back and converse and dialogue and learn with us as we continue to grow in our appreciation and knowledge of Indigenous and Native peoples. Please make sure that if you are in need of any kind of protection, uh, if you are experiencing any form of discrimination, whether you are an Indigenous, indigenous person, a Native person, or any other person that is a part of our protected family. We want to encourage you to reach out to us at OHRE at HowardCountyMD.gov, OHRE at HowardCountyMD.gov to let us know how we can continue to protect and promote your human rights. So again, make sure to follow us at HOCO OHRE on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we look forward to being with you in person, to celebrating with you in person and continuing to learn and grow uh, around the human condition together. Have a great rest of your day.